In the years after the Vietnam War, there was a surge in the development of totally new designs and the modernization of older ones. These developments were driven by two factors. One was the deficiency in USAF aircraft and missiles that had been revealed by the Vietnam War. The other was the impressive series of new planes being produced by the Soviet Union. Among them was the MiG-25. Even before the Vietnam War had ended, the Air Force was anxious to create its own designs. It was embarrassed that two of its most recent procurements, the McDonnell Douglas F-4 and the Vought A-7, had originally been designed and built for the Navy. In the previous decade, the procurement climate had changed drastically. Costs had increased. The procurement process was intensely scrutinized by Congress, the media, and the public. Under Secretary of Defense McNamara's total procurement package, there was no fly-off competition. The airplane you bought from on-paper submissions was the airplane you got. This cumbersome procurement process caused development costs to balloon to as much as $3 billion. It was used for the last time on what was to become the standard USAF air superiority fighter, the F-15. A new fighter had been needed since the mid-1960s. There was a year-long paper competition between North American Rockwell, Fairchild Hiller, and McDonnell Douglas. McDonnell Douglas won. Their design became the F-15 Eagle. It was a design that responded to all the lessons learned so painfully in Vietnam. I christen the Eagle, and may you reign supreme in your domain. Yeah, yeah. The Air Force came out of the war in South Vietnam knowing exactly what it wanted in an air superiority fighter. First and foremost was maneuverability. McDonnell Douglas obtained that in the F-15 with large wings and relatively low weight. It wanted speed, and this was provided by two huge 25,000-pound thrust engines fed through these cavernous intakes behind me. This power provided a great rate of climb, and this particular aircraft, the Streak Eagle, set eight time-to-climb records, the last of which was to more than 98,000 feet in less than three and a half minutes. The F-15 pilot has superb 360-degree visibility through the huge cockpit canopy. The Eagle took full advantage of the electronic revolution. It was designed to work closely with AWACS aircraft. It has the latest impulse Doppler radar, inertial navigation, and heads-up display for instrumentation. The F-15 first flew on July 27, 1972. Unlike the F-4, it does not produce long trails of exhaust smoke to give its position away. It became operational with the 58th Tactical Fighter Wing on November 14, 1974. Even as the expensive F-15 was in development, there was pressure within the Pentagon for a lower-cost alternative fighter. The Fighter Underground was a small, independent group of Pentagon-based Air Force officers dedicated to the concept of a lightweight fighter. At first, their efforts were rebuffed as an intrusion on acquisition of the F-15. The procurement pendulum had swung returning to the fly-before-buy concept that had served so well for so many years. The lightweight fighter the underground promoted was perfect for seeing if fly-before-buy still worked. In the lightweight fighter competition, the General Dynamics YF-16 won over the Northrop YF-17. By this time, the F-16 had overcome opposition within the Air Force staff. It was seen as a swing force fighter, meaning 
that it would be able to perform air-to-ground missions as well as its originally intended air-to-air -air role. The F-16 was selected as the standard fighter for Belgium, Denmark, Norway, and the Netherlands. It became the largest international military co-construction in history. It made its combat debut with Israel in the famous strike against the Asarek nuclear reactor near Baghdad, Iraq. The round trip distance of 1,200 miles for that attack was accomplished without refueling. Later, the F-16 was used in combination with the F-15 with devastating effect in Israel's invasion of Lebanon in June 1982. Eighty Syrian fighters and five helicopters were shot down without any Israeli losses. It was an incredible victory ratio, a tribute to both the Eagle and the Fighting Falcon. In the 1940s and 50s, Six new fighter systems were acquired in production quantities each decade. In the 1960s and 70s, only two systems were procured each decade. Now it looks as if only one fighter, the Lockheed F-22, will be procured for the rest of the century. The 1980s began with a totally new approach to air power. The new Reagan administration gained congressional assent to pour massive amounts of funds into the largest American rearmament program in peacetime history. The Reagan administration was determined that the United States would in future conduct its relations with other states from a position of strength. There was another covert goal to bring the 40-year-old arms race to an end by bankrupting the Soviet Union as it strained to match the U.S. buildup. One of the Air Force's first tasks under the new administration was to remove the stake President Jimmy Carter had driven into the heart of the Rockwell International B-1 program. President Carter canceled production of the B-1 in 1977 opting instead for a cruise missile weapon system. In 1981, President Reagan reversed Carter's decision. He authorized production of 100 B-1Bs as an interim bomber. Work on the cruise missile was accelerated. So was the development of the super-secret stealth bomber which in time would emerge as the Northrop B-2. The highly modified B-1B was the first new bomber to join the Strategic Air Command in more than 20 years. The B-1B had stealth characteristics. It had only 1% of the B-52's radar signature. With its terrain-following capability, it was a very potent penetrator. But it was plagued by stories of protracted development and by exaggerated reports of difficulties in testing. There were problems with the terrain-following software, but they were corrected early on. The major deficiency was the B-1B's electronic countermeasures suite. It has never performed as required. But despite this, the B-1B is known by its crews to be the best operational bomber in the world today. Its long gestation period has been justified.
The Minuteman was a three-stage solid propellant intercontinental missile. It began to enter SAC in 1962. By 1967, it had reached a force level of 1,000. Missile silos were built in remote locations. They offered instantaneous response to an enemy's first strike. Missiles also offered new challenges to Air Force personnel. These ranged from technical expertise to the psychological ability to adapt to life in a silo. Missile crews on alert had to be prepared to survive below ground level. The demands placed on families through stress and separation were equal to those long experienced by bomber crews on alert. Hundreds of officers used slack time to take correspondence courses. Cards were a last resort. Missile crews took pride in their work. They knew it was critically essential. Practice alerts happened with nerve-jarring frequency. The Air Force realized the need to maintain performance levels and morale in this difficult environment. Incentives were offered. Competitions, recognition, and awards gradually build a spirit among the missile force to equal that of bomber crews. The latest and most accurate American ICBM is the Peacekeeper. Taken together, the ICBMs, the air-launched cruise missiles, and the traditional bombers make up what the Air Force calls a triad for deterrence. Establishment of this triad was expensive and time-consuming, but ultimately successful. It created the enormous pool of physical and intellectual capabilities that brought about the Air Force domination of space through satellite-based military systems. The intercontinental ballistic missile did not replace the man bomber, but it did create a world of new requirements in research, recruitment, training, and career development. This became an essential springboard to the Air Force's establishing a supremacy in space power that exceeded its own aspirations. The reality of space power came almost silently on the scene. A major reason for this quiet approach was a series of international agreements outlawing weapons of mass destruction in space. Yet space is the ultimate high ground. It is essential for ballistic missile warning and for a multitude of satellite operations. Control of space is necessary to protect U.S. and allied space-based systems. It can also, if necessary, neutralize any potential enemies' space systems. Air Force space power was built gradually. While this happened, most public attention focused on the strategic triad of ICBMs, submarine launch missiles, and traditional bombers. Technology housed in the growing network of Air Force satellites increased the effectiveness of conventional air power manyfold. 